All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in again. My name is Ian. And I'm Jacob. And for the next two sessions, we'll be, yeah, we will be having Derek Murphy talking about how to start an F FTC team. And after that, we will have Caleb Mech on scouting app development. So here is Derek. Ah, good afternoon, everybody. I uh, hope I'm not taking up your, uh, your lunch time. Uh, we're going to talk today about uh, the first technical challenge. Uh, first technical challenge was introduced into uh, Ontario last year for the first time. Um, it's been probably run in Canada for uh, close to six to eight years, um, and it is growing. It's what we would call that, uh, that middle level first. So after working in FLL, you can overlap into um, the first technical challenge or FTC, and then you can go on to, you know, to the big robots uh, in FRC as you go forward. So I just have a, a little bit of a presentation um, for you going forward uh, on what the first technical challenge is. Um, and I'm just gonna lead you through the steps of starting your initial first technical challenge team. Uh, I'll also briefly talk a little bit during this session about um, how events are gonna be run this year or how events are going to be planned um, to be run this year. Uh, and I just hope that you get a, a good introduction um, as you're going forward so that uh, you can see it. Um, I do have uh, a chat session live, so uh, we can try to answer some questions for you going forward. Uh, things are still a little bit fluid with COVID-19, um, but uh, you know we should, uh, we should be good and I, and I hope you get some great information from this session. All right. All right. So, what is the, the first technical challenge? Uh, I hope everybody can see the correct screen right now. It looks pretty good. Um, you know, the first thing that we like to say when we talk about uh, FIRST Robotics uh, and robots is that participating in FIRST Robotics is, uh, is way more than building just robots, okay? Um, there's a lot of things that, that students get from it. There's a lot of things that myself as a, as a supplier, as a mentor, as a partner who's helped to bring this to Canada, get from it. Um, it it's great, and I mean, to give you a big example, uh, every year, and, and it's unfortunate that we can't right now, uh, you know, we get students in who are participating on first teams. Uh, we bring usually six to eight in during the summer. And in fact, at our office, our head uh, research and development engineer is a first mentor. And he is now actively designing hardware and electrical components and, and software that will be used by first teams uh, worldwide. Um, so first technical challenge, we'll start with, uh, with what a team is. Um, it's a little bit smaller than an FRC team, uh, which makes it uh, somewhat easier to manage. It's usually um, up to 15 members. Uh, some people would say a typical team is around, is around 10 members. Um, and the first technical challenge students can be from grades seven to 12. So we do have some uh, FRC teams that are mentoring uh, teams that will, they'll, they'll develop up into their FRC, okay, with the first technical challenge. And they'll start those students with their feeder schools um, down at the middle school level when they go forward, all right? Those teams, just like um, FRC, and I'll talk a little bit about the differences in a, in a little bit, um, they're gonna build program um, and operate a robot uh, to play a small floor game in an alliance format. So we do have an alliance format in FTC as well. Um, each alliance will be two teams uh, instead of three teams. Uh, and they'll be guided by their adult coaches and their mentors. As they do this, they develop some really good skill sets um, in science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, and even if we wanted to take this to the, to the moniker STEAM instead of STEM, uh, we do get that arts because the teams are going to be working on their graphics, their presentations, um, their their speaking skills, uh, all sorts of great things, right? And what they do uh, at that team level uh, is they learn engineering principles and the value of hard work, innovation, and sharing ideas. The great thing about it is that with a smaller group of teams and with a smaller robot platform, you can and we're doing pilots with this right now in Ontario, bring FTC directly into the classroom. So it can be done as a classroom skill set. You could have two or three robots or two or three teams per class. 
Uh, and because of the, the typical time frame schedule that you're looking at, uh, you can do that right at the classroom level. Okay. So this is a, a picture of a typical FTC court. Uh, we took an overhead shot of, uh, of last year's game. So when we talk about the court size in a minute with the playing field, you'll see it's a smaller playing field. Um, generally will be uh, 12 by 12. Uh, later on in the presentation, we'll talk about remote events and the size of the field for remote events. You will see with this that we have four robots on the court at one time and we have an alliance of two teams. So we have the red team and the blue team alliance. So typically with FTC, um, we can run events and a lot of it depends upon how uh, First Ontario will organize it. You know, we can run one day events, we can run two day events, uh, you could run events after school and you could run um, league events, okay? Uh, we're not at the stage right now for league events uh, and I don't wanna, you know, take away from what, what FIRST does and how they're going to organize their events. Um, but typically, the hardware that you see here will pack up in one small case. Um, somebody once asked me, can I fit it all in a minivan? And I said, absolutely no problem. So one minivan, you can take it in, you can set it up, uh, and you can get an event running typically within under an hour, okay? Um, that said, of course, you do have your pits, you do have your, your practice fields and so on. Um, but at the smaller scale, it's much, much easier for people to manage and to get started with. Um, so I showed you a picture of the playing field. Uh, the playing field for a game in FTC uh, basically consists of a uh, foam mat surface surrounded by a metal or Lexan field frame. Uh, that was an official game field that we showed you there. Uh, you can build them yourself for local uh, competitions. Okay, they're not that difficult to put together. Each tournament uh, will feature an alliance. So that'll be two teams which will compete uh, against one another and they'll be playing on that playing field, right? Um, the teams will develop their strategy for designing and building these robots um, using uh, a modular kit of parts, okay? And I'll, I'll show you some slides later and we'll, we'll talk a little bit um, about that. But typically what happens in, in FTC are when you register, there are two um, kit of parts options that you get. Uh, the price gets subsidized for those from two manufacturers. Um, but you can use a kit of parts. You can design a robot uh, on your own if you wish. There are certain rules uh, and controls that you have to do. But for most teams to get started, you just use that modular kit of parts uh, to begin to build your robot and work from there. Right. Um, students typically are going to build and code those robots, as I said, uh, work in an alliance format. The nice thing about the kit of parts is that it's completely reusable. Uh, you can use it in the classroom. You can use it at home uh, to design mechanisms. Okay. And it is powered by uh, Android technology. So typically, uh, the way that it works is we have a, a controller that runs on the robot that runs the Android operating system. Uh, that'll be our, our robot controller. And for our driver who drives the robot uh, within the first technical challenge, they will also have uh, a cell phone. And that cell phone will be hooked up to their uh, remote, and that will be their driver workstation. Okay. Uh, because we do run on the Android platform, what that enables us to do is it enables us to run uh, the coding and the programming in a variety uh, of levels of Java-based programming. So on our Java-based programming, we, we get three options. Uh, we get something called um, Java Blocks, okay? This is a block-based programming, uh, much like Scratch uh, 3.0 that is used. We typically would use uh, block-based programming for new teams uh, to get them familiar with it. Uh, we also find that as, as students are transitioning up from FLL, for instance, or, uh, you know, maybe they've used uh, some introductory coding software, they can use the blocks-based program to get used to it. Uh, there's also something in uh, FTC called Onbot Java. Uh, this is the second level of Java programming. And the reason that they call it Onbot Java is that the Java itself uh, runs on the robot controller and on the cell phone. 
What this means uh, from a coding standpoint is that if we were going to use either the Java blocks or the OnBot Java programming, uh, typically we do not need a computer or a full computer to code with. So we can access the programming tools from a web browser. Uh, what that enables us to do is to use, for instance, an Android tablet, uh, an iPad, okay, a Chromebook to program with, or I've actually seen teams, and it can get quite messy, um, program on their cell phones themselves. Okay, So from a cost standpoint, if you wanted to um, start a first technical challenge team, your hardware resources can be reduced, and you don't need to make that much of an investment um, into a large uh, or full-scale computer system. If you do get into the third uh, programming option, uh, which in our case is um, Android Studio, uh, then you will need development hardware, you will need a computer, okay? Uh, this is typically we find for more advanced teams, uh, and the higher you go in your programming levels, uh, actually the, the, the more you can do. So, you know, you get a little bit more control. The downside to that is that you have a lot of setup and you have a lot of learning and so on. But, you know, for a rookie team to get started, you can start, and, and uh, what we've done with FIRST Ontario is that we have created a series of, of eight lessons for you. Um, these are all published in video format. And what you can do is you can have an introduction to blocks programming, you can get started. We have an introduction to building your robot. You can get started. Um, so there are a lot of resources there for you going forward. So nice and easy, um, three levels of Java-based programming. Uh, it can also be used as a tool to get your programmers uh, ready uh, when you want to take them on to a bigger team and you want to do FRC. Uh, typically, teams will, uh, will also raise funds, okay? So there is within that team uh, community outreach, okay, that's going to happen with it. There is within that team uh, branding, you make videos, okay? There is Dean's List Awards and so on. Um, so much, much typical to what we would do in a, in a FIRST Robotics Challenge as well, just at a smaller, uh, smaller scale. All right. Um, so once again, a uh, quick uh, side picture of a, of a field. So this is one of the practice fields from last year's uh, Ontario Championships. Okay. Just gives you a little bit of an idea of the size um, and the scale. Uh, and the type of, of things that you would do uh, on that court, red and blue alliance, okay, and different skill sets that are required. I will point out um, one thing about, about FTC, um, and the idea here was just to introduce you to, to starting up an FTC team uh, and the typical steps required through it, not running the FTC team completely, but uh, what's typically going to happen um, in the first technical challenge is that we tend to uh, – to have it so that, well, we have autonomous and teleoperation for robotics movement. The autonomous portion, which runs the first portion, usually for 30 seconds, you can actually score more points in autonomous than you can in, in teleoperated. So there's a little bit of a different strategy uh, as well here, and it can be a little bit of a greater focus uh, on the coding skills. But as I pointed out to you with those coding skills, you can start at a basic blocks level and then progress up and get more and more advanced as you go forward. All right. So we'll review it. So first technical challenge, it's a head-to-head -head competition um, using a, a sports model. Um, this year's game's uh, really interesting. Uh, the ultimate goal game, we are going to pick up rings and shoot rings to score and stack rings. Okay. Uh, the teams, so your team will design, build, and program robots um, based upon you know, basic and good sound uh, engineering uh, principles. The hardware platform. The platform is reusable every year, uh, and basically it's powered by Android technology, okay? And you'll program using um, Java or Java blocks. So three options, Java blocks and on-bot Java, uh, as I said, where you do not need a full computer system. You can program those using an iPad. You can program that using a, an Android tablet easily because you're just accessing the robot through a web browser. Or you can go into um, full uh, Java running on Android Studio. The teams uh, will develop their strategic problem-solving skills, their organization, their team uh, building skills. 
there's awards for each competition. There's awards for community outreach. There's awards for your design. And, you know, your students can also, once again, qualify uh, worldwide for over um, $80 million uh, in scholarships. Okay. So what's the difference? Um, there's a lot of differences between uh, the two programs of, of FTC and FRC. Uh, typically, people will ask a lot of, a lot of different questions uh, as they go through. Um, one of the biggest differences is that FTC generally is, has fewer members. All right? um, you know, typically, we could see uh, an FTC team or an FRC team, sorry, of, of 15 to 30 students, whereas an FTC team you know, generally are about 3 to 10. Okay? Um, with this, one thing about that FTC is with that smaller group is we can, you know, usually see a little bit more hands-on engagement with the robot itself, okay? Uh, the t team members are probably going to have to share uh, more tasks. So, you know, people that are building may also be programming. People that are programming may also be doing community outreach and presentations, okay? Um, so usually we get a little bit more um, hands-on. Uh, the robot build usually takes less time as well, so you don't have to schedule as much time during a typical build season um, going forward. Uh, game, initial game or registration for FTC, as an example, begins in May. Uh, game launch will be in September. And then, you know, depending upon the way that your events are scheduled, and I'll talk more about it, um, going forward for the way that Ontario is doing it this year. You know, you typically this year would have from September until January, okay, to be able to build and test the robots. And there's a lot of resources there for you when you start an FTC team. So we can give you a, a typical schedule, um, what you would do per week, how many times you need to meet per week. Uh, but I've seen them, you know, one hour or two hours per week. So typically this will fit really well um, into your classroom. All right. Okay. Uh, I will do a quick talk about, uh, about remote events uh, uh, for you. And um, there is a link in this presentation, uh, which is a video that, that one of the teams had put together on how to run uh, remote events. Uh, because of, of COVID-19, uh, the uh, first Ontario has already talked about remote events and how they're going to run. So I just grabbed this information from the product announcement. Uh, I'm not going to speak directly to it because I, I don't run the events. Um, but basically with a remote event, um, a team can compete um, individually using a half size field. So instead of doing a, a 12 by 12 field, we actually cut one section out of the field. All right. Um, there would be no alliance partner or uh, uh, no opposing alliance so that you can properly um, respect that social distancing, all right? These events will also have remote judging um, across the, the same awards, same as you would with a traditional event, okay? So, you know, typically what's going to happen is you can run your autonomous section for 30 seconds um, and then your teleoperated. Uh, the scoring uh, will be changed a little bit, um, but you can do an event uh, completely remote, all right? Uh, We've also been working on things with, with FIRST on, you know, setting up field locations uh, that are uh, properly disaffected that allow for proper social distancing so that teams, if they don't have a full uh, facility or a way to have that practice field, you can do that. However, they have allowed for you to, you know, if you don't have a practice field and you can't afford a field, uh, you can actually just tape it out on the floor and, and score that way, okay? Uh, so there's plans, it's in that YouTube video. Um, you'll see how you can put things together. So this is your, your typical schedule. Um, January 23rd to February the 13th for this year will be remote qualifying events. Um, and the first Tech Challenge Championships will be at the same time as both the FLL uh, League Challenge and the first Robotics Provincial Competition. Uh, the date is still there. The date is still planned. Um, you know, things can change, but, uh, you know, this is what's going to happen typically um, going forward for this year. Last year, when we did not have um, remote qualifying events, the, the schedule was pretty well the same. Our first event for the FTC Challenge was um, January the 20th. So, you know, when we launched the first week of September, 
you know, you had September, October, November, December, and into January um, to build, plan, um, test your robot. Uh, and most of that typically was done either at the school level or at the after school level. So I just wanted to, to talk a little bit about remote events. Um, they are planned, uh, they are announced, uh, and everything is, is already been put in place to conduct those very, very successfully. All right. So what are the seven steps uh, to start a first technical challenge team? Um, when you launch off, the first one is you got to sit down and, and get familiar with, uh, with the challenge itself. So to do that, you gather your support resources, um, you locate your region's affiliate partner or first senior mentor. Okay? Uh, that information can be, uh, can be passed on to you. Uh, our affiliate partner uh, that runs the FTC events is is uh, Dave Ellis from uh, First Canada, okay, just so you have a reference. Uh, unless he's passed that off, in which case I'm sure I'll get an email from Dave shortly telling me why did I, I give out his name, okay. Um, they're going to be able to help you. They'll know what other teams are participating, okay, um, how you can get support, what resources are available for you. Uh, we spent the entire summer this year, uh, every Wednesday afternoon from four to five, um, conducting workshops for new teams and new team mentors. Uh, we help them with programming, we help them with robot builds and so on to get them ready and prepared so that they can um, go through it this, uh, this year, all right? Um, so there are some um, links in here. Uh, these links will go to the, to the first website. So typically if I, if I clicked on a link, okay, uh, what's gonna happen is you'll see uh, on that screen going forward, and, and hopefully you can see uh, that on my share screen right now, okay, that you'll get a started team checklist. So everything is live here um, and everything will take you through. Lots of resources to, uh, to get you started, okay, uh, and away you go. What I'll do is I'll, I'll just do a quick, uh, quick stop share on my screen, um, just in case we didn't get that, uh, that going through completely. And I'll just share screen two again. All right, um, just so that you can see that, yeah, typically we can launch out starting a team checklist is here. You can download that checklist, all sorts of resources there um, to get you started and ready to go. All right. Okay. All right. Let's go back a little bit uh, again, and we'll we'll talk more uh, on the presentation. Okay. Uh, just so that we can see it. So you get starting a team checklist. You get team management resources that will help you out, and you will get the numbers for your local support. Okay. Next one. Next thing you got to do is uh, enlist your coaches and your mentors. So I have, we have community-based teams. Um, we have uh, school-based teams, all right? Generally, each team is gonna need um, two or more adult mentors, all right? Uh, these teams are gonna be motivated to coach the team through the build and competition season, okay? Uh, one thing I've learned with FIRST Robotics is that the students are absolutely um, outstanding, okay? Like I said, my head guy, James, at the Office for Research and Development, he came to us initially uh, from a first team, from team, uh, team 1241. He was one of the programmers on that team, and he came to us for co-op. And, uh, you know, six, eight years later, um, he's our head research engineer. And there is absolutely no way with my multiple engineering degrees and so on and so on that I even begin to remotely know what James does. So... Don't be afraid um, to start and run a team as a coach or a mentor uh, because those students will probably help to lead you as well, all right? So you just need to be there um, for them during the build and competition season, all right? Um, you can have other volunteers, the same as you have with the FIRST Robotics Challenge. Um, they can help you with your administration and your fundraising and so on. And I, you know, I found this coffee mug earlier today on Amazon, the first mentor coffee mug. So any of you that are mentors uh, and you want to see that, I, I think it's kind of funny. Um, for calories, it says 99% pizza and burgers, okay? Um, and then it lists, uh, lists all sorts of stuff. So they probably overcharge for that, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a great resource. 
There's a full mentor manual. Um, I put the mentor manual um, in the presentation and I'll make sure that uh, 2056 has this if teams want it, okay? So that mentor manual takes you through the, the skills required, what you need to do and how you're gonna work uh, through that as you go. So you need uh, generally two um, is what you need when you register the team, okay? Um, you're then gonna register um, and pay. Uh, I can bring up a little bit uh, later on and show you a, a typical budget um, for a team and, and the way that a team works. Uh, the first thing you have to do is you have to, uh, to register your team. Uh, once you register your team, uh, your, your name goes in the database, you get on the list and you start to receive communications from FERCs first. You'll get a temporary team number when you register that team. This will allow you to start to prepare um, for events, okay? Um, you don't have to pay yet um, for, the, for the registration. Registration for a team for a year is, is typically around uh, $275 US, okay? But what you can do is you can register the team, begin to get communication so that you, you understand, um, you know, what's going on, and then you will be able to check for available grants or maybe first Ontario has a grant program that can help you along the path to get that team started and to fund that team. So first step is to, is to register. Um, the second step would, would be to pay, okay? I did put a note here that says, um, you know, once you submit and register a team, you're not, you're not committed yet, okay? It's just so you can start getting um, information, people can start to send you things, and you know, basically we can begin to help you, uh, and that's what we'd like to do with it. So the steps are here, you're gonna create uh, and log on a first account. For those of you that have either done um, FLL or FRC, it follows the exact same procedure, uh, and you'll be able to check for grants. Right. Now I will point out that when you register a team, um, there will be some options that you are allowed to do. So you can choose just register. Uh, you'll then have the option to purchase your, uh, your control system, okay? Your control system basically consists of, of the electronics that you need to do a basic uh, robot. So it will consist of the control hub that goes on your robot, the cell phone that you use for your driver workstation, uh, the, the remote controls for your driver workstations, your cameras, and your base sensors that you are allowed to use and put on the robot, okay? So you would register and then you'll get your control and electronics. There's a third option which allows you to select what we call your, your kit of parts. And that is that uh, reusable uh, you know, robot collection that we have. There's two options that are, are listed on the website. There's one from uh, Rev Robotics who do make the control system as well. And there's one uh, from Tetrix, okay? So you can choose either one of those if you want. If you don't do that, what you can do is you can go and you can either build your own robot or you can use other kits of parts that are pre-done and pre-ready for you. The only thing I tell you to do is to make sure that you read um, the game manual, uh, game manual part one and game manual part two. These are part of the resources that you will get. And with those game manuals, they'll tell you what components you're allowed to use on the robot as an example and what components you are not. Okay, so you know, typically the motors that you are allowed to use um, to drive your robot, they would be the motors that are included in those two kit of parts. So there are some, um, some restrictions, uh, but it tends to be you know, a little bit open as you go forward. Okay. Uh, fourth step that we do when we're gonna start a first tech challenge team is we build our team. So you gotta find some students. Uh, a lot of times the students will, will find you, all right? Um, so you're gonna find them, it's gonna be a maximum of 15. Um, you know, we tell people, make sure you emphasize that there are no technical skills uh, required. Uh, we just want people who participate in FIRST Robotics to be enthusiastic and to have a willingness to learn, all right? Um, look at all sorts of different talent. You can see by the team members here um, from, from 2056, uh, and I was listening to the previous presentation, you know, and, and, and you know, one parent's, uh, you know, kid was taking care of all the video and the presentation and somebody else, and even Emily, who's on Team 2056, she's running this complete conference today, okay, um, doing a great job in putting things together. 
So you need all sorts of talent to be able to put that team together. And typically what I tell people is that it's like any mix. So if you've got a really smart programmer and another student isn't a programmer, well, guess what? They're going to learn from one another. So you're going to get that, that, that mix of, of talent, uh, and it's just going to be an overall great experience for them. As you build your team, what you want to do is you want to get together and look and grab the mentor manual, okay? Um, there's also building teams that build robots. So there are resources for you in the resource library uh, to allow you to build robots. And there's a guide on team outreach or team outreach and, and marketing. So when I go to team outreach and marketing, you'll notice that, you know, we typically have uh, branding, promotional things. How do we recruit teams? There's an editable flyer there for you to, to go out and try to re recruit teams. We have, you know, videos. What is the first tech challenge? So if you want to understand more uh, with this, it's all there and it's all ready for you. Robot building resources are here, okay? So the robot building resources will be guidebooks that put you together. There's basic bot guide and there's videos. So there's videos on how you wire your robot, videos on how you program and code your robot. There's design resources for you. How do you 3D print parts to put on your robot? So it's, it's all there, um, it's great information. And you know, one of the things that we spent the time with over the, the summer this year was we took this information and we made it for um, First Ontario. So using these as guides, we put together programming resources for you and guidebooks for you. We made a whole video series for you uh, and those will be uh, useful and available uh, as you work through and go forward, okay? All right, I gotta stop my share again to get my other, uh, my other screen back. And we'll come up. So you're gonna build your team uh, and get that together. Okay. Fundraising. Um, fundraising is the key uh, when you're gonna work things. You need to have a budget. I'm gonna show you a, a typical budget uh, before we are through the workshop today. You wanna to try to find uh, a local sponsor if you can to help you out. Uh, there's a lot of them that already have a relationship with FIRST. Uh, FIRST Canada can help you with that to be put, put things together. Um, there is a, a presentation that was uh, uh, done by some teams from last year as well that has been recorded that we'll talk to you, okay? How do I do fundraising? What's good fundraising? What has been successful for us in the past, okay? Not quite as big um, typically when you're going to do FTC as it is with FRC because the component parts are less money, the events are smaller, the teams are smaller, okay? So, uh, there's lots of opportunities there you can explore, um, including both grants uh, that are available to you for both rookie and veteran teams. So on the links, there's a sample team budget. Uh, I'll show you my sample team budget. Uh, there's a grants uh, and there is a typical uh, fundraising guide to help you, uh, you know, run and put that team together. Okay. Should learn about safety. Um, at first, student safety is always um, paramount. Okay, um, so if you are gonna start the team, what you have to do is you have to be familiar with the Youth Protection Program, the YPP. There's a series of uh, videos that are available for you. Uh, a lot of information in the mentor manual as well, okay. Uh, the other typical thing when we talk about safety is this is um, student safety here, okay. But you also have safety when building and designing. So because we're using a, a kit of parts uh, that can be reused over and over again, when working in FTC, we can typically get a robot together uh, at a smaller scale using only simple hand tools. So, you know, a lot of big successful teams in FRC, they may use a computer numerical control machine. Uh, you know, they may go out and have water jet cutting done and so on. The electrical requirements uh, have a bigger battery uh, a lot more current draw. So, you know, there's more safety to be considered there. But, you know, typically, you know, when I show you my, uh, my budget, you'll see that, you know, I, I can start an FTC team with a few hand tools. Uh, I could put the robot together in the environment that I'm in right now, and I can be successful. Right. Okay. Step seven. 
So step seven when you're going to start a team is to review the mentor and team resources. Um, so there's a wealth of information that's on that resource library. That's what I keep clicking to as I go forward. Technical guides, fundraising guides, activities for your teams to do, uh, building robot resources, team management resources, okay? Um, one thing about the first world and the first environment is that you are not alone. Uh, there are people there to help you if you want to start a team, and there are people there to, to, to guide you along your journey um, as you go forward. So review those um, uh, team and mentor resources. Don't be afraid uh, and get yourself started as you go through. All right. Um, so just about the, the season, um, it, it varies by region. Okay, uh, so this is a, this is a general slide uh, from first. So typically the season in Canada will, you know, will begin in May or June. Um, this is when registration opens. So teams will be able to uh, register their team. You'll begin to start planning. Like I said, what we did this year uh, is right after registration in June, we ran a series of, of workshops for one hour uh, every Wednesday afternoon. We did those the same way we're doing them now. Uh, we did them over video with Zoom. Uh, we had a live um, Discord going at the same time so that, you know, teams could typically try the skill sets we provided in one week or mentors, and then the next week ask questions, and then we would go on. And by the end of eight weeks, we had a, a robot successfully built. Uh, we had a robot that would, you know, go out and program and, and try to do the year before its challenge. So we did, we did the previous challenge, all right? Um, typically, your design and build season uh, would start and run in September, October. You will notice that in, in Ontario right now, the first event is pushed till January. So our build season is gonna be, you know, an entire close to a semester uh, as an example out of a high school, okay? So tournament season varies. Um, there's nothing from within October, November, December timeframe from having you have, an, uh, you know, your own local event or a practice event um, right now, we, we've got robots on the court at our office, um, you know, practicing different uh, skill sets as we go forward. Uh, those are typically what we call a scrimmage. So, you know, we just scrimmage. Uh, you know, we go out and play shinny with the robots, basically. Um, hone the skills um, and have a little bit of, of team and have a little bit of fun. We actually have set up um, right now the full court. Uh, we have, you know, typically a few robots. So if I get plans from different teams, as an example, and they want to hone those skills or they don't have the robots, we can put them on the court for them and we have multiple cameras on that robot so that we can have them practice code and do different skills and so on. That's one of the reasons why uh, during the summer training, we all built the same robot. Uh, because what can happen is that if you want to see how it works on an actual court and you don't have one, uh, we can actually upload your code to our robot and then run it and see it. Uh, and get some practice at it. So this is your, your typical season um, for a first technical challenge, okay, uh, when it happens and how it works out. Um, what's your time commitment? So the mentors or volunteers are gonna meet um, usually at least once a week, okay? So uh, during September to April and during build competition, okay, we, we tell people that you're probably gonna have to meet um, at least once a week, okay? Uh, if you have more free time, uh, you're, you're welcome to do that. Uh, there's no problem whatsoever. But, um, you know, as a team member, as a mentor, as a volunteer, uh, once a week from generally mid-September through, through April. So typically it's like any other um, sport or after-school activity if you're going to do it after school. Uh, however, you know, we tell people the more you invest, um, the better you can become at your task. But as I like to point out to people, and, and we've been working hard with this with a lot of different um, schools uh, around the province and across Canada right now, is how do we take FTC and let's put it in the classroom, okay? So because the robots are, are, are less expensive, because it can also be used as a general classroom resources, right? I can take a, a one of my classes and make, make four teams in it. Um, I typically don't have to register those teams if I don't want it. It would be nice if they all competed. Um, but at least those students can, can build skills sets in the classroom and, and work in the classroom. Because if I only meet once a week and my class is, is two or three times a week, then that time frame can fit well into that schedule. 
But overall, your time commitment is less uh, and it works out quite well, right? Um, first steps, this was a, a slide I put together, um, you know, going forward, uh, just to introduce people. I did this for the 2019-2020 season, okay? Um, just to help you get started. Uh, you know, sit down if you decide to do this in your register and come up with a plan that typically fits your team, okay? If your team is not strong on, on, on uh, autonomous programming, you know, that's fine, but sit down and say, okay, this is what works for me. Because to me, it's not about, about uh, you know, winning. I know that everybody wants to win, but it's about the experience and it's about the learning that goes, goes with that. And there can be some really great learning that goes forward um, as you put things together, okay, uh, and how your team goes. There's two parts to the game manual. There's um, game manual part one and game manual part two. So when you decide to register, you will have access to game manual part one. Um, that gives you the, the basic overall rules of, of how you schedule FIRST Robotics and how it's all put together, how the kit of parts works and so on, okay? So you can have an understanding of that. Game Manual Part 2 is released when the challenge is released. So, you know, it can't be one of your first steps. Uh, so, you know, typically it's not going to happen and you're not going to see that uh, until launch in September when you're going to look at that and you're going to go forward. Okay. Um, you know, a, a couple of things I, I, I talk to people when you start the first uh, technical challenge, um, and this is important stuff. So if you want to do it, um, read Game Manual Part 1 and Part 2. Um, you can't play the game and remember that first technical challenge is a sports-based game uh, if you don't understand the rules, okay? Uh, I tell people to build within their limits. So if you don't have a lot of experience, uh, you know, keep it simple, right? Sit down and part of our training to take you through is to say, yeah, in, in eight hours, and we did it in eight hours of learning, and then probably with another hour per week or two hours per week after that, over eight weeks, we, we successfully built robots and we successfully programmed those robots, okay? We also built and programmed robots to do and get on the court with the task without adding any additional cost, okay? So, you know, build within your limits. Um, uh, you know, take a look and think about how long it's going to take and make sure when you decide to do something, um, you know, that you can afford it. Uh, I have people right now for the new game asking me all sorts of things. And uh, I do have this graphic that I share with everybody once in a while that says, welcome to robotic season. And it, it's a student just putting money into a vending machine, okay, to try to get different parts. So, you know, don't, don't try to reach into something that can get too complex. Um, there's a lot of teams out there with a lot of resources. Um, but remember that when you're working with an alliance, Okay, just learn to do a few things well. Um, build simple, uh, do one or two tasks, and document uh, everything. So, you know, make your notes, make your engineering journal, uh, document everything, make videos. And when we do a full season and take you through the learning process for this, um, typically what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to allow you to put this together and help you through it. And a key term that I tell people is to um, set a schedule and stick to it, okay? So that is very, very important going forward. Um, I'm not going to do an overview of this year's game uh, right now. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stop that share. And I'm just going to see if I can typically find you a typical budget. So let me bring that up. All right. And I'm just going to pop that up over here so that you can see it. And I had put together this, um, this spreadsheet, okay? Um, I, I call this one uh, Rookie when we're gonna look at it, uh, just so that you can see it. I, I have multiple ones that I, I do and put together. Uh, I've got Rookie one, I've got one for an advanced team, okay? Uh, and I've got one for, for a middle team. But let's say we're a rookie team um, and we wanna get started. Okay, uh, this is typically what I'm going to see uh, on a budget going forward. Okay. So this is my worksheet, uh, worksheet for, uh, for rookie teams. I did this one um, for last year. I did convert all of this um, into Canadian dollars for you. 
And I have said here what's required and what's not required when you want to start a team, okay? So the first thing I, I talked about was the registration fees. So your registration fees um, have a maximum minimum budget here. Uh, typically, I take that 275 US and convert it to Canadian dollars, and I, I generally come up at $375. So your registration is about, about $375, okay? There can be event participation fees, okay? Um, so when you register for a provincial event or so on, these change every year. Uh, maybe if you're gonna do a scrimmage, there's a fee. Uh, I put a maximum budget of $400 in, a minimum budget of $300. So, you know, we'll say, if you're gonna participate in an event, there's probably a fee there. So, so I had um, $200 as an average fee, okay? Your kit of parts. So your, your kit of parts is here. Um, there's a different components to it as you go through. So you do have the control and communication set. It will typically come out to about $305 Canadian, okay? Uh, a lot of times you can add um, an expansion hub to that. I put it in the budget. It, it's not required the, the control and communication set. Uh, typically how you go, you can, you can get all the parts in it, but you probably want another hub, so it's $175. And then you've got that reusable kit of parts. And I Sorry. have the reusable kit of parts in at about um, $650. Sorry, okay. Derek. Yep. Um, so someone asked if you could zoom in to the, uh, into the ah. stream. It's, it's, yeah, I looked at the stream. It's, it's really bit, small? It's a bit small, cool. yeah. No so problem. If you can zoom in a little bit, that'd be very nice. I got great big screens, so yeah. let's go to... I can't hear them. I can't see the chat. So how's that? Okay. Uh, one second. Okay. Yeah, that's is, a lot better. Yeah, it's a lot better. Is that better. better? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Ian. Okay. Excellent. Yep, no problem. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I'll go back. Typical typical budget. Sorry about that. Uh, I don't even have my glasses on, but I've got three screens on my setup. So, you know, this is this is that that typical budget. Um. I will also say that this is um, this is what we call the the subsidized price. So when you register a team, you're given the option to select uh, the control and communication set and so on. And what happens is that that actual price is subsidized for you a little bit. Okay. So when I give you the rookie team budget, it's usually based upon getting one robot kit um, and putting it all together. All right. So. You add it all up here, uh, and it, it's it's going to be close when it comes up. But what I've done is I've said, okay, you know, if I want to buy additional parts, you know, I'm going to budget for a rookie team, but another two hundred and forty dollars, okay. Um, or maybe a couple of other stuff, so motors and servos, two forty, some sheet metal, some Lexan, some zip ties, you know, two hundred twenty five dollars. Uh, and I give you three levels here, okay? Um, minimum, maximum, and so on. But the required stuff is is the only stuff that's up here. You know, and typically after registration, if you do that, you're going to, you know, $600 for registration, okay? And, you know, let's say probably here $1,250 for your basic kit of parts to get started. So typical budget for a team um, to get everything that's required to start is is probably just under two thousand dollars, right? Um, I budget along as we go and look at it as well. So you'll see for software it's all free, okay? So whether you're going to use FTC blocks on by Java or Android Studio, okay? Um, the development platforms are free. Uh, as I said, if you don't use uh, Android Studio, you can get away with uh, a Chromebook at the school, or I use my iPad. Um, to be able to program your robots, all right? Um, I've got tools in here. So, uh, you know, I, I wrote in here, buy, borrow, I, I won't say steal, but um, there's lots of stuff that you, you can find. Um, you know, typically you just need uh, some, some screwdrivers, some Allen wrenches, uh, a voltmeter. So, you know, this can cost anywhere from $350 at the maximum to budget to $50 at the lowest, all right? It's the same thing. We, we do a lot of design on 3D printing. Um, it is optional, so you can add little component parts to your robot, okay? Maximum 150. If you don't have a 3D printer, you don't have a 3D printer, that's fine. 
you go down to zero dollars, okay? So the budget's there. Um, uh, typically, if I was running a community-based team and I was starting from scratch, okay, you'll, you'll see that I have a nice expensive laptop now that's good enough to run Android Studio at $750, okay, uh, down to, to $500. And in fact, you can get Chromebooks for, for, for $180, okay? So the, the budget is there um, for you to look at as you go through, all right? I uh, will talk a little bit about the, um, the field items. Okay, so the field itself, that perimeter and the rubber tiles, um, you know, it typically is probably going to cost, um, if you don't own it, around $1,150 for a field. Okay. Um, that said, you can build a half field. Um, you can look at your own field. We've made them out of plywood before. Okay. Um, the, the foam tiles I've got off Amazon and so on, there's all sorts of things. Um, it's recommended, uh, but it, you know, it needs to be done once, uh, you know, and, and it can be re reused every year, the field. So the field can be used over and over and over and over again, all right? If, for instance, you've participated in, in, in something like VEX Robotics in the past, it also uses a 12 by 12 field. So technically, it's the same field uh, on foam tiles. So those fields are completely 100% um, ready to go, and you could use those, all right? You can buy game elements, um, and game elements can be a half field or a full field. The cost will vary. Uh, as an example, for this year's game, if I buy a complete set of game elements, all right, it's, it's about $450. Uh, if I buy just the rings that we need to shoot uh, and, and some of the things to put together, uh, you know, the price goes down to about $65. So every year there will be that cost for the game elements. Okay, um, you know, it's an annual purchase and you can work that into your budget. Uh, generally, those, those dollar amounts um, stay about the same, okay? So on this for a rookie team, I then even added t-shirts, okay? Completely, uh, completely optional, right, uh, for what you want to do. And then as a typical budget spreadsheet here, you know, I've said high, medium, uh, low, okay? So if I went and bought a 3D printer, bought myself a big computer, bought a full field, registered, got a robot, and got a whole bunch of extra parts, there's your budget dollar. Mid-range, there's your budget dollar. And just to get started, you know, I want to be honest with people, uh, that's probably a good value in Canadian dollars, okay? Uh, there would, of course, depending on upon where you're going, uh, be travel expenses. Uh, you know, that said, it, depending upon where you want to start the FTC team, remember that an FTC event uh, is usually one day. So, you know, you can typically get there in the morning uh, and leave at the, at the end of the day. Uh, it is a long day. Uh, I'll point that out. I think we started last year at, at regionals at 8 a.m. and we were done at 7 p.m. at night. So it is a long day, all right? But it just, just allows you to, um, to budget. Okay, and to give yourself uh, a resource. And we've put this into a spreadsheet for you, um, you know, just to make that access so that you can see it. All right, okay. Oh, Emily's telling me there's, there's questions on the chat. Um, so what I'm gonna do is, uh, is I'll, I'll just uh, close that off uh, from that section. I, I feel more than uh, welcome to ask, answer questions for you. Um, what I do want to show you is I just want to show you uh, quickly. I'll share a screen again uh, on the first website. So firstinspires.org, uh, you can go there and typically you will find all of the resources that you need um, to get started. Okay. So, so I was already there under the uh, FTC resource library. Okay. You'll notice that I have all my build resources that were there. Uh, we've done that going forward. Okay. So, you know, we can go back to the first technical challenge, look at that community. And I, I just want to point out that, that everything that I covered is here. How to start a first tech team is here. Um, you know, it's, it's all there, right? So when you go in, you'll see, you know, exactly what I want to do. How do I, how do I learn more? How do I start a team? Okay, there's your, your how to start. And the seven essential steps that I talked about uh, will be here as well. Okay, so you know what sort of programming resources do I have? 
Um, they're all here. Complete video tutorials for either blocks, uh, Ombot Java, if you're going to use Java, and sample robot builds to get you started as well. So um, everything's there um, as a good resource for you to go. Okay. Um, the chat. Oh, Emily, you're trying to help me out and tell me that it's in the show doc at the bottom table. Except I can't see that right now. <laughs> um, Ian, uh, okay, here we go. Can you explain the difference between ecosystems? Ah, uh, I understand that question. Okay, um, I got to answer this question unbiased. How's that? So, with the ecosystems, um, they they change all the time for building. Okay, um, and some people, if you go, for instance, on Chief Delphi or, or Reddit, there this one is good and and this one um, isn't good. Okay, uh, Rev Robotics um, has an ecosystem. They build the control mechanism or the Rev Robotics hub, and they will build the sensors that you are allowed to use. Okay, uh, that building system typically has been um, extruded aluminum channel, as an example. Um, they now make a C channel. Um, they now make a U channel uh, as well. Okay, uh, you can buy chassis from Andy Mark. Uh, on the building system that are pre-done in a platform for you. Uh, there's a, different companies that make different systems for that. Or I have teams that build it completely from scratch. Um, on, the, on the bias side, um, we at Studica just launched our own building system, a Canadian building system. Um, we're developing full curriculum for that. Okay, It's a channel-based system as well. But you know we looked at, at what teams wanted and what teams didn't. Uh, and outside we did that. So you can build with what you want. The core is with game manual one that there's only certain motors that you can use, okay? And, and you know, one of the reasons for that is that the, um, the control hub, so I have a control hub right here. This is the controller that goes on the robot, okay? It will only run certain motors uh, on the interface. And the software is only set up for certain motors. So we can either then run um, the Rev motors from Rev Robotics or the Tetrix motors from Tetrix or Nevrest motors from Andy Mark. All right. So that's why typically there are the two official suppliers. Um, but, the, you know, the, the building systems are, uh, are, are pretty good. We used the Tetrix last year um, for the teams, and the reason we used that is that as a company, they were willing to um, subsidize us and give us a little bit of a, of a less cost so that we could pass that on to our Canadian teams to get started, okay? Um, you know, but, but typically, that's what you want to do. And I mean, I'll give you a prime example. A lot of teams last year, they added mechanic wheels to their robots. Mechanic wheels can be expensive. Um, so here in Canada now at, at Studica, we just designed and built our own mechanic wheels. We used a universal hub mount system. Um, so teams can use them for different things. Uh, so not only can you use them for FTC, you can use them for intakes, for instance, on FRC. Uh, and because we developed them, we have a lot of flexibility in the cost. So we, we can pretty well cut your cost in half uh, when you want to add mechanic wheels. And we pass that on to our, to our Canadian teams. So hopefully I've answered your question. Are there any other questions, Ian? Uh, I don't see any right now. Okay. But Emily sent out a message in the chat. So if anyone does want to ask any I'm questions. I'm going to try to open that up and I'll see from the, uh, from the show doc that she sent. Yeah. So let me just try to open that up. I'm sorry, I thought it would show up in the in the bottom of the Zoom, but I guess because your live feed, it doesn't do that. Yeah. Yeah. All uh, right, we got one here. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. to, yeah, okay. Up. I'm ready. All right, how many hours per week do your FTC teams typically work? Um, I would say one to three, you know, but, but that, that said, uh, there's always people that, that will work more, but usually on, on a schedule, you can meet for an hour uh, and get them started and do a typical build. So when you're going to start out, uh, the basic build 
bought and and some of the people that, that worked through this summer um uh, you know could could do it within an hour but i i would say you know typically one to three hours per week yeah all right cool um we got another one how many teams do you expect will compete in ftc in ontario this year and how many tournaments do you expect there will be um, that's a good question. That would be better f right now for um, it would be better for First Ontario to answer that question uh, than me uh, because they're the ones that are that are scheduling the events or First Canada. Uh, you know, last year we had we had 32 teams. Um, I know registrations right now are are a little bit higher. Um, the difficulty is with COVID-19, people are still. Uh, trying to sort out um, what they're going to do and how they're going to uh, do that. Okay. There is the first event scheduled, but a lot of that depends on the amount of, of registered teams. Okay. Right. Um, you know, I, I know that we tried, we had um, 18 new teams on board in addition to the 32 that we had last year. So we were up to over 40 teams. But, you know, depending upon school board restrictions, some are allowed to participate in, and some are not allowed to participate. So, you know, I would, um, you know, go and, uh, you know, get a hold of your contacts at, at, uh, at uh, First, First Canada, whether it be one of the senior mentors um, or Dave, and they'll be able to answer that question for you. I, I just, I don't see access to those numbers, that's all. All right. I don't say any more. Okay. Currently. Yeah, I had an hour and a half, and I, I said it would yeah. probably take 45 minutes to an hour for this one. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I people can just have lunch now and, and get yeah. ready for uh, <laughs> for uh, for Caleb because uh, scouting is important, and I don't know if that's his own app or not, but that's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. He, um, yeah, he like, develops the whole thing. So, yeah, he's going to get into yeah, more depth about that. That's cool. He should sell it. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So if, but, uh, if yeah. there, yeah, if there's no more questions for me, um, I, I will pass this back over to Ian. Yep. Uh, I think he's going to keep this stream live because like I said, yeah. Caleb is, is coming in in about uh, 25 minutes, right? Uh, yeah. Should be about one thirty, or now, um, whatever, whatever works for him to do that. Uh, but I'd, um, I'd like to thank everybody and, uh, Hopefully that was a little bit of a good introduction to, to FTC. All sorts of resources for you, all sorts of support for you. Um, give First Canada uh, a, a shout if you want to participate because uh, we got all sorts of good programs that will, will help you get going. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, thanks for coming on. All right, thank you.